All right. Welcome here, everybody. We're so glad you're here. And those of you who are online, thank you for, for joining us this morning. And we're so excited for the book of or the letter to the Church of Pergamum. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And so it's going to be very interesting to discover and just pray that God would bless us as we read his word, as is the promise. And so let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for gathering us, your people, here this morning. And Lord, as we look at the book of Revelation, that you'd speak to our hearts. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you um, just revealed your thoughts and your word from the Father to us through John. And Lord, as we look at it today, we pray that it would speak to our hearts, that you would overwhelm us by your Holy Spirit, and that we would just discover truth that was unfathomable before but that becomes so clear and crisp as we look at your word. So go before us, Lord Jesus. Be glorified in our lives and uh, pray, Lord, that you would uh, uh, just cause us to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll just invite Karen up to uh, come and uh, give us a bit of an introduction, and then we'll dig right in. That's wonderful. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, been a busy weekend. Hope everybody's awake and ready to study this morning, because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. <laughs> anyway, so uh, welcome, uh, all of you. Thanks for coming, and for those of you that are joining us from home. Um, and so, as you know, we're in the middle of the seven messages to the seven churches uh, from Christ and through John. And um, uh, these messages is, are really Christ's comfort and his encouragement to the churches and the believers who, of course, were suffering a lot and were undergoing tremendous temptation as well and not doing so well in many cases and so his purpose was to empower them to overcome and so for myself I like to have a simple way to remember things and so I have a bit of a simplified summary which I mentioned to you last week so each message is comprised of three parts it's actually more which Al talks about but three parts um, remembering that Re revelation first of all is primarily about Jesus primarily about Jesus Christ as we learned in chapter one with all those amazing descriptions of who he is. So uh, three parts in each message. I am, I know, and I promise. Of course, I am is the statement that identifies himself that is linked to chapter one. One of the descriptions of Jesus in chapter one is used for each of the churches, each of the, uh, the seven churches. And then uh, I know, um, and I know type of statement where he knows, I know you're suffering. I know what you're going through and I understand. And there, it's a very intimate and kind of affirming statement that he gives them that comforts them which shows his love and his presence and his care for them and they're very healing kind of words so this is an intimate relationship and then i promise those who persevere receive a very specific eternal promise not just eternal life but the very specific eternal promise which he uh, promised for each of them so last week we looked at ephesus and smyrna and the focus verse was, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And the take home was um, a little confusing because we hadn't communicated very well. Jesus' power, presence, and promises empower believers to overcome. And then the application, how do others experience the depth of my love for Jesus? Remember, Ephesus was about losing their first love. So how deep is our love for Jesus and how did other people see that? And then this week we're looking at uh, lesson five, which is three churches, Pergamum, Thyatira and Sardis. And just a little um, uh, hint, we may not get through them all because Al has got lots to say about Pergamum and uh, important stuff. So we will take it week by week and see how we how we do. But the first two, uh, Pergamum and Thyatira, had problems rejecting false teaching. Uh, either false teaching or false leaders. Sardis had become very lethargic and kind of spiritually spiritually complacent. and But all of them had really lost their grip on truth and the fullness of who Jesus Christ was to them. But in, in Pergamum, which is for sure what we're going to look at today, um, it, the description is about him, he who comes with a two-edged sword out of his mouth. And of course, the two-edged sword is representative of his words, the spoken word, and the two-edged sword divides distinctly between truth and falsehood. And it was very appropriate for, for Pergamum's problems. And then for Thyatira, it says his eyes of fire cut through the lies and deceit. Uh, it doesn't say that, but that's that's the implication. 
And the seven spirits of God saw clearly the spiritual slumber at Sardis. So nothing's hidden from God. He sees our failings, yet he calls us to repentance so that we can overcome and receive those blessings. Focus verse for this week, 3-5. He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white. <clears throat> I will not erase his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The take home for today, the spirit leads willing believers to resist false teaching, reject deceitful leaders, and repent. And the application, how is knowing God's written word sharpening my discernment between truth and falsehood? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And right, because there is so much in these letters, even though they're so short, um, I am finding it just about impossible to get through them all. And, and I think they're the most important thing because it's a time in which we live. So I'm going to look at the Church of Pergamum today. And there is more than enough information there to keep us going for, we could do it for weeks and uh, still not get through it all. So uh, again, just a really brief divine outline from God in, in verse 19, write the things which you've seen in the vision. That's the visions of, of Christ in chapter one. Um, then we have got uh, the second point, which is those things that are now happening. This is chapters two and three, which we are studying now. They were contemporary. These were real churches, real time places. They were there when John was writing about them. You could have gone and visited them. You could have discovered the truth about it. By visiting those churches and it is the church age in which we are and then finally the things which will take place after these things the prophetic words metatauta is the greek word the things that are yet to come and those are um, going to be interesting but they're less important to how we live our lives today what we're going to discover today is how we ought to live our lives as believers and uh, there's a blessing there's a special blessing for those who read out loud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart that which is written in it. And so we're going to be blessed as the promise of God uh, as we take a look at these things. We also saw that Christ defines himself um, and uh, he, he clarifies that the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the messengers the divine messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches now over and over again we get this constancy in the word of god you'll remember the uh five virgins who did not keep oil in their lamps and the fives that did they had a job to do it was dark it was night and they needed to be the light uh and so the five that were because the call came at midnight and they lit their lamps and they did their job and the five who had no oil could not they went out to see if they could buy some. I'm not sure what you buy at midnight, but by the time they returned, the door was shut. And so a huge word to have us prepared and ready to do our job, which is to be the light. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your works and glorify your Father who is in them. It's all about giving glory to God, giving glory to Jesus for what he accomplishes. We're going to have a shine conference, a men's conference at the end of the month. It's going to be very powerful. It's exactly the theme. And it's what we as a church needs to do. We need to spread out the truth. We need to to give the light out. That is our job in the world. And it is a very, very important thing. Um, I, I was a little confused initially about this concept of the divine messenger. I've got it straight now, just as a result of discovering that Jesus called John the Baptist the messenger. So with that, um, we're going to get right into, um, um, well, first we're going to talk about the titles and we discover them. And all through chapter one, and uh, we, we see that Christ actually um, clearly clarifies who he is. And so every time we have uh, um, those things that uh, that that announce to us the, the name of Christ, it fits with the name of the city. It fits every time, right? Uh, and so uh, we're going to take a look at these seven churches and they actually follow the order of history. So Ephesus is the first church, the, the, the birth church. Then we have the church that is crushed by persecution. Smyrna, myrrh, which means being crushed through persecution. And uh, the enemy, the devil, in this cosmic battle, tries to crush the church, is unsuccessful. Today we're going to talk about Pergamum. Perga, in its Greek form, talks about being married to the world and it's it's a, an unlawful marriage is in essence what Pergamum means and so we discover that uh, by the time that we get Constantine so we have 
multiple emperors that start slowly to embrace Christianity, allow Christianity to be. And then we see Byzantium becomes the center of the Roman world, which uh, is is uh, at the border between Europe and Asia, right? It, it is Constantinople, it gets called, and is today Istanbul. And it is that city that then he moves. It's so corrupt in Rome, he moves everything to Byzantium. And he starts, uh, some, there's a, a story, a legend, which I believe is a legend because it does not sound like something that Jesus would do. Uh, but he sees the sign of the cross in the sky. His father had prayed to, to Jesus and had been successful in a military campaign. And so then he believes he sees a cross by this sign, you shall conquer. Well, that's not right. We know that. And yet it's interesting because we now see this marriage between church and state, right? And that ultimately uh, continues to rise. It ebbs and flows. We get a couple of emperors who then try to go back, right? And then eventually we get uh, Theodosius, and Theodosius full on ushers it in. People of the church are are elevated. They're 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 given places of high rank, and on and on it goes. And you ultimately end up with this marriage. It becomes a compulsory thing. And so now suddenly you have reprobate people who are buying and putting themselves in places of power through Christianity. And we get this incredible watering down. And, and this is what it really we're going to discover is a theme in, in the letter to the Church of Pergamum, which keeps repeating itself. And we're going to discover exactly what it is. So um, here who has an ear... Let him hear and heed what the Spirit says to the churches. We're going to try to apply it locally to the church of that day, to uh, Ephesus, Sardis, and now Pergamum at the top. And now we're going to uh, discover that Ephesus was around neglected priorities. You've lost your first love. Smyrna was around satanic oppression, getting really, really a lot of opposition and discovering that they were persecuted. Pergamus is about spiritual compromises. <clears throat> it's admonitory to all of the churches. So as we read, we discover they're all written to all of them and they're all written to us. We are to read this. It's very, very important. And I believe that it's the reason that is so controversial because it's what God wants us to hear the most. So the devil wants to make sure that we don't hear it at all. Yes. That's right. It's personal. It's homiletic. It's to us. We're going to discover these things that are very practical to us and very personal to us, and we're going to discover that there's things that are prophetic. Don't forget, we're looking for the name of the church, the selected title of Christ that he uses to explain himself, the commendation, the concern, and exhortation, and a promise to the overcover, and finally, a very standard closing, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This outline we're going to use for each and every church. So if you're working in your books and you're trying to figure this out, um, one of the challenges you were given last week was take a look at the churches that are coming and hopefully Pergamos was first on the list and you started to follow that outline. It's an evaluation card. And my slides are going a little slower than I hoped, but that's okay. It's a little bit repetitive, right? We need the outline because we need to identify emissions and we discover all churches are surprised. So a little bit of history on Pergamos. Prior to Alexander the Great, Pergamus was little more than a castle on a hill. Its foundation is ascribed to an Arcadian colonist under the Heraclete Telephus, who routed the, uh, all these words, eh? Achaeans on their landing in Mysia to attract Troy. So all of that history is available to us. It was very much documented. There's architecture that goes with it. We could spend a year just looking at all that history. It's derived from the son of Pyrrhus and Andromache, who made himself king by killing the king in uh, Tuthracea. I haven't got that exactly right. By killing the king in a single combat. And we have movies about that. We have on and on it goes. But here we go. We have this marriage that we're going to discover. Um, in 301 BC, Antigonus defeat, is defeated. Uh, Northwest Asia Minor is united into a Thracian kingdom. And then um, it's got a really impregnable position. So we discovered this is the world of commerce, and you're going to see what that's all about. It's a two-headed snake on a pole, which is interesting. Um, you know, uh, we're going to discover this, this place is very much tied to Satan. Um, you're going to discover that it's the seat of Satan. What's the symbol of Satan out of Genesis? 
snake. A snake. So uh, interestingly, their medical world and their history of the city was such that you'd invite people in and uh, the priests of that cult would give you stuff to have you fall asleep. And then snakes would come gliding over your body as night as you're dreaming. And you would have dreams that would help direct and identify. Uh, a lot of this up until Hippocrates is very much psychological, psychosomatic. You go back to what the e Egyptian medication was compared to what God provided through Moses. You, you read Moses is still pertinent today. You discover incredible things like uh, vitamin K in, in, is highest on the eighth day when circumcision was. Who knew? Who knew all that stuff? The washing of hands. The Romans dipped, right? The, 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 the Hebrews always poured. All the things that we know to be true today come out of the Bible and all of the secular stuff. So, so up until Hippocrates, we discover that healing was all very psychosomatic and very psychological and about these dreams and on and on it went, right? Um, carry on. Pergamus is about 18 miles from the sea. All the other ones were port cities. And that's probably partly why Pergamus does not stay very high in rank as a city uh, uh, politically. Uh, but it's a very good place to keep your money. It uh, ends up being a little bit like the Swiss banks of today. Uh, it, it, Pergamum was that. Um, Zeus is said to have been born there, and this is very, very important because we're going to discover there's an altar there. It's no longer there. It's in Berlin today. Oh, my goodness. What a story. And it's set very high. Uh, the caduceus or the escalapis is the official emblem of the city. The caduceus is the two-headed snake. The escalopis is the one-headed snake. Now, interestingly, it all comes... Um, out of the story of Moses, you remember the children of Israel were in uh, the wilderness and there were snakes, fiery serpents, the Bible says, and they're biting the people. And Moses calls out to God. He says, God, what should I do? And God tells him, Moses, make a brazen, a bronze serpent, put it on a stick, put it up high. And as people look at it in faith, they will be healed from the bite of the snake and they shall live. Very, very interesting. Well, that thing hangs around until Hezekiah's day, many, many thousands of years, and people start to worship the snake. What is going on? That's not what God had intended. And it's not until John chapter 3, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless as in the days of Moses, the Son of Man is lifted up, and people look at, to him in faith, we suddenly discover the truth of it. So, Talking about evidence of the word of God as being written outside of our time domain. The people that wrote it did not know the stories that unfolded were not made clear. But the minute we get Christ, we understand it fully. Go to John 3. That'll be your homework for tonight to go and read that and discover, oh my goodness, it actually had a purpose. And Jesus is the first to describe it in the New Testament. All of the Old Testament leaders did not know. And why did Hezekiah have to destroy it? Because people hung on to the symbol instead of Christ that it was expressing for the future years to come. That's how our ambulance is today. It is, absolutely. <laughs> Except for they have the caduceus, not the escalapis. And the escalapis is actually the healing aspect. And the caduceus is the financial, <laughs> which is just hilarious because suddenly it becomes about the finances and not about the healing. Fascinating. Um, so um, the Greeks later depicted um, Escalapis, the son of Apollo and the virgin Cornoy as um, holding the two-headed snake, which now is Hermes, the Hermes staff is the god of commerce. And it's interesting, hospitals typically always use the two-headed snake. And that, that how on earth does that symbolism make its way to the 21st century and is still prominent first because it's on every ambulance, it's on all of their letterhead and, and it's the two-headed snake and it's the god of commerce. Wow, and there it is, it's exactly as Paul is saying. And um, the two-headed snake on a stick, the god of commerce. But all of this goes back, and there's Hermes, um, an early depiction. This is an ancient, ancient Roman sculpture uh, back in the day, the time of Christ, right? And, of course, the snake symbolizes Satan. So we're going to discover this is, um, this, is, this is Satan's home. This is Satan's home. Unbelievable. The Escalapus, and then, of course, the Caduceus. All right. Jake, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right? These are the words of the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live. 
of where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, um, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Uh, you have people there who, have, who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin uh, by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you, know, you also have these who have told the teachings of, Nicol of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and it will fight against them with, uh, with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear that the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of, my, some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a, a white stone with a new name written on it. Um, no, only to him who received it. No, only to him who received it. Thank you. All right. What is the name? The name is Pergamum, which uh, out of Greek is uh, para. It means bad or not good. And among, which is the... Uh, marriage aspect of it so to the church in pergamum and it's 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 the the starting of of the church becoming married uh to society to culture very scary and if satan couldn't crush it through through martyrdom and through persecution he's going to conquer the church by marrying it oh my goodness oh my goodness the title of christ Him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Now, again, we have constancy in the word of God, right? If you put on the full armor of God, uh, right? Take on the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, and take up also the sword of the Lord, which is the word of God. That is the combative. That is, that is what allows you to conquer. It's going to be very interesting when we get to the part of Revelation where Jesus triumphs. Oh, at the Battle of Armageddon, it's his words that do it. The people actually kill each other. It's very fascinating. Um, and so God speaks forth the word. And you remember when he was uh, tempted by Satan, he always conquered with the word, right? The word spoken truthfully and in context, not the way Satan speaks it, deceptively always leads to victory for, 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 for Christ and for his efforts. Commendation. These people have a really interesting challenge. They are in the city where Satan lives. Guys, this is not like you might just be registering those thoughts for the first time, but there it is right at the end. Uh, your city where Satan lives, where Satan has his throne. Wow. And the symbol is the snake and it's commerce and it's their medicine of their day. Oh my goodness. Did it come up in blue? I know where you live, where Satan has his, has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. <sighs> we have three hours to unpack all of what's here. We only have 20 minutes. Oh, my goodness. So this is a historic reconstruction by German uh, in engineers who were doing archaeology, Carl Human. He, he goes out and does excavations and he discovers that there's a temple to Zeus on the highest spot. So Zeus was born here. We got to have a big temple to him and it's huge. And there's also a Pergamum altar, an altar, a throne, a throne of Satan. Oh, my goodness. And on it, they would have sacrifices. And uh, you got sacrificed if you would not uh, confess allegiance to Rome. So just real quickly, who is the first emperor? to be deified in Roman history, who up until, up at, like the Greeks, the Greek culture always only had gods on their coins, but suddenly in the Roman Empire, we end up having a Caesar. Who is it? It's Caesar Augustus ends up being on the coin and he, de he gets deified posthumously by the others. So now Caesars are all gonna become 
gods and we 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 start to see caesar worship and and pergamum was the first to embrace it and so it was really easy so so domitian who i've explained to you um uh, is the son of vespasian the brother of titus who destroyed rome so vespasian titus under nero are told go deal with with israel so they do they try but then Nero dies. So off they go back to Rome. And then there's a few emperors who very quickly commit suicide or are killed. And so now suddenly Vespasian becomes the emperor of Rome and his son Titus is given the job. Son, you go do it. We we're supposed to do it, but I'm going to stay here in Rome now. You just, just go do it. Just go go and wreck Rome. And in 70 AD, he absolutely raises uh, the, the, the temple and he throws every rock uh, not one stone is left upon another. Now, you see a little incense altar there, and it wasn't hard. You take a little incense and you go like this, and you just put it on there, and the smoke goes up, and there's the, the, the sculpture of Domitian. That's all it took. And then you get a letter from a magistrate, and it says that, that you paid your dues to Rome, and you're good to go for the next year. Until next year, you have to do it again. And it's a way that Vespasian, who's now taking control of the Roman Empire, makes sure that everybody in his kingdom pays allegiance to Rome and puts them first, because everything is in the context of religion. And that's our deity. And so Domitian can't wait to die to become deified. He says, I'm already God. Right? I'm already God, so I'm still living, but you burn that to me because I need to know that you're going to be true to me. And Antipas says, I can't do that. But how many Christians might have actually says, well, you know, I'm not going to believe it. I'm just going to do it so I, I, so I can avoid persecution, right? I'm just going to burn a little incense. Like, how can that be bad? Surely God will, will overlook that little offense. Maybe I just burn a little incense. So what? No, 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 no. If you want Christ not to deny you in front of the Father, you can't deny him here on earth. You have to hold true. You have to take your stand. You have to say. And so Antipas takes a stand against Domitian, chooses not to. And this is out of the Greek Orthodox Church. It's St. Antipas. And you see him in a brazen bowl. It's obviously very, very stylized. You actually got pushed in through a little door at the bottom. And they built a huge fire underneath the bowl. And so basically on this... Um, this this altar to Zeus, Antipas is burnt in a bronze bull. And they had it designed so that the sounds that he was making in there would come out of his mouth. And it was entertaining because Antipas is getting grilled and it's a big public spectacle. Everybody comes to see it. Now you know what happens to those that will not burn a little incense to Domitian. Oh my goodness, you don't acknowledge Rome? You get burnt inside a bull like this, and they make a public spectacle of them. And this is the Antipas that, that Christ is referring to. Very, very interesting. So here in, in the 1800s, we, we have the maps um, by, by the uh, Karl Heumann from Germany, who, who is, is drawing the maps. And you can see the altar to Zeus and the temple to Zeus. And you see the Temple Mount. And here in Berlin is the Pergamum Museum. And interestingly, it has the gate of Ishtar in it too. So talk about anti-Semitic. So Ishtar is where all the, the, the Jews were actually put into slavery, right? Oh my goodness, right? In Babylon. And here you now also have the, the throne of Satan in, in Berlin. Karen and I went there to see it. It was still up. So in 1930, it finally gets a new home. In 1909, they built a home for it, but the museum is, is on unstable ground, so the building has to be torn down. By 1930, it opens up in Germany again in Berlin. Well, there's two very important and influential people to, to go to see it. And one makes me cringe because, because one is an architect. Oh, my goodness. So they go and they're inspired by the shape of the building and say, wow, this is cool. This is really impressive. Um, interesting that our, our archaeologists and scientists have brought it home. And here it is. And we've got this incredible museum. And so Albert Speer goes to see it. Not, not, not with this other man, but he goes to see it. And he's a, a, a German architect. And he is going to... Uh, take a look at this thing and then we have Adolf Hitler and you know that's maybe how he looked about the time right in 1933 and he goes and sees as well well it gives him this huge inspiration you know what let's 
build, let's, let's, let's build ourselves a tribunal. And we're going to build it just like, like that throne of Satan. And I'm sure, you know, it's the Pergamum altar. They very much keep hiding the fact that it is the throne of Satan. Nobody's reading the Bible. Nobody's really putting two and two together. So in Nuremberg, they build a stadium and it holds 200,000 people. Hello, 200,000 people, 200,000 people all come together in Nuremberg in the late 30s. They're not all sitting up there, though. They're no, like they're on the ground all around it. We're going to see pictures of it in just a minute. But you can see the shape of it is exactly like the Pergamum altar because Albert Speer and Hitler are influenced by it, right? So they build this massive thing, right? And they build it on the design of the Pergamum altar. And then they put these anti-aircraft lights in. And there's the tribunal at the front. And right, 200,000 people need this whole field. And so they, they do their military marches there. And this is where they then decide, okay, how much Jewish blood do you need in you for you to go to the gas chambers? Well, if it's three generations ago, we might forgive you. But if it's only two generations ago, and it's just your mom, but it was just once, and they have a little chart, and you have to check your lineage to find out if you have to go to the gas chambers or not. And all of this rolls out as Hitler and his group are sitting under the tribunal. Do you think this is the throne of Satan? Hello, absolutely the throne of Satan. And so we see this transposition of the Pergamum altar coming to Germany. And guess what? This place here, this, this place in Nuremberg um, is being held and restored. Gosh, but theoretically in perpetuity so that we don't forget and this will never happen again. But the Pergamum altar has also just gotten a new home for five years from 2015 to 2020 it was uh it was only a hologram you could see but now you can go see you can go see it again it's 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 now in a, a newly restored building in berlin and there it is now just interestingly it becomes a spoiler war and about the time that uh that stalin is killing more people in russia than you could ever many many of church people um it's in moscow then it gets repaid, re, re, what do you call that? Uh, when, when, when the spoils of war get returned, right? It comes back to Germany, to Berlin, re, re, repatriated. repatriated to Germany. And there it is. It's in Germany again. Makes me really nervous. How did they move such a huge building? <laughs> rock by rock. It was, they loved their archaeology. Yes, eh? Bring it all from Pergamum and bring it to Germany. Never probably realizing all of the um the spiritual impact of that right oh, and how it was do. So yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so people continued up until the 1990s to come to hitler's tribunal to blow up pieces of it they bring dynamite so this town nuremberg wrestles with this because people are still retaliating against it so now they've got it enclosed and being re restored men ah all right <laughs> definitely the city of satan definitely the throne of satan there's there's no there's no um no other way of seeing it okay what's the concern yeah what do we know about balaam very famous story very unusual story very miraculous story balaam? He's than his donkey <laughs> he was dumb well he was less um <laughs> less aware than his donkey right right we have a donkey that speaks guys karen was showing me a video the other day and there's a little dog and he's listening to oh uh, we're going to go for a walk and and this dog is listening to a telephone call and he's all perked up and and then uh, we're, oh, we're gonna have snacks and a treat and now he's really up there and and then we're gonna clip his nails and now he buries his head under under the pillow right because he doesn't want to have his nails clipped and he knows that sound of those words means that i'm gonna get my nails clipped. oh no oh no right so um animals obviously get something more than what we realize when we talk but uh this donkey is perceptive right anyway did it go blue Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some of you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. 
All right, and then finally, there's an exhortation. Repent, otherwise I'll come soon to you and we'll fight against the Nicolaitans with the sword of my own. Now, it's interesting. I will come to you, to the church, and I will fight against the Nicolaitans that are in your church, right? Very interesting. Anyway, let's have a quick look at Balak and Balaam because it's so essential. The Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. They're conquering the land, right? And now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified because there were so many people that came out of the desert after Egypt, right? And, and this generation later, and everybody's still aware, and oh my goodness, they're a strong desert-hearted people. And Moab is filled with dread because the Israelites. So the Moabites say to the elders, the Midian uh, of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us, just like an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summer Balaam, son of Beor, who was a Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. Because this guy's got a connection to God. He's not a Jew, but somehow he, he's got a relationship with God, and he's considered a prophet. He does it for money, which bleh, is evil to begin with. But that's the idea. Uh, a people has come out of Egypt that covered the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they're too powerful for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. And the elders of Moab and Midian left taken with them the fee for divination. And, you know, it's interesting because Balak eventually will say, I don't care if you give the whole house full of silver and gold. I can't help but to speak truth. And whatever God says, I can say. And whatever God does not tell me to say, I cannot say. So this happens seven times. Interesting. We see seven. We see that heptatic structure over and over again. So Balaam says, stay here and uh, have a night here. And I'll report back with the answer that the Lord gives me. Obviously, someone in the night, he's going to get a message from God. And so the Moabite officials stay with him. Well, he tells them not to go. God tells Balaam, don't go with them. So they go back empty handed. So Balak does not take no for an answer. Sorry, this, this would take an hour just to read this, guys. God relents and lets Balaam go along. But as long as you tell him exactly what you say, and then Balaam starts on the road. But somehow God recognizes, oh, man, maybe Balaam's going to go astray. So this isn't good. Balaam says to Balak's servants, okay, I'll come with you, but God has made it clear to me, I have to speak only his words, and I don't care if you've got a house full of silver and gold, I don't care how much money you want to give me, I don't, I don't care, I can only speak the word of God, interesting, eh, here's this guy that works for money and prophesies for money, so he saddles up his donkey and he makes the trek, and Balaam's donkey refuses to go on because an intervening angel that only the donkey can see. So he rubs his foot against the bridge, and then he does this, and then he does that, and finally he lays down, and he keeps beating the donkey until finally the donkey speaks to him. Oh, my goodness. Well, we have to read it. This little bit, we have to read it. It's just too amazing, right? Okay. Balaam got in the morning, saddled his donkey, went with Moabite officials, but God was very angry when he went. He's recognizing, oh, man, he's going to go, but will he really do what he said he's going to do? And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. And Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing on the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into the field. And Balaam beats it to get it back on the road. Now, donkey sounds is really humble, but there, it's actually the Cadillac of the, of, the, of the desert. I just had a friend who was in Peru, and he said, I was, I was, I was taken up onto the mountains on a mule. And, oh, my goodness, the things are so sure-footed. You felt totally confident. And he was riding around. It was just, it was absolutely amazing trip. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards. With the walls on both sides. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord oppressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beats his donkey again. Ah, then the angel of the Lord moved to go ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the so he couldn't go in the field again or anything, it laid down under Balaam. And he was so angry and he beat it with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouths of the donkey and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Now, don't forget, I'm a literist. I believe this actually happened. I believe that donkey spoke. Balaam heard him. This is exactly what happened. There's, this is not allegorical. This is the story. Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me with my two servants here. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you've always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. 
He bowed down low and fell face down. And the angel Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here uh, to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. I'm worried that you're not actually going to do what I tell you to do. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. I did not turn away. I certainly would have killed you by now, but I have spared it. Balaam said to the angel Lord, I've sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you're displeased, I'll go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the Balak's officials. So then Balaam says, okay, well, listen, heptatic structure, build seven altars and prepare seven bulls and seven rams. And Balak does it. And they offer a ram on each altar. And then he says, stay here with your offering. Well, I'll go aside. And he goes up on a hill on a barren height. And God met with him. Balaam said, see, I've prepared seven altars. And on each altar, I've offered a bull and a ram. The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, go back to Balaam and give him this word. So we went back to him, found him standing by his offering with the Moabite officials. And Balaam spoke this message. Now, don't forget, he's hired him to curse Israel. Make sure we win this war. Curse them. But <laughs> every time he opens his mouth, it's a blessing over Israel. This is his first message. Balak brought me from Aram. The king of Moab from the eastern mountains. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come, denounce Israel. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? From the rocky peaks, I see them. From the heights, I view them. I see a people who live apart, who do not consider themselves one of the nations, who can count the dust of Jacob or the number even of a fourth of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but you've done nothing but bless them. He says, must I not speak what the Lord puts into my mouth? Okay, four times this happens, right? And he can't curse him. Finally, it says he cursed his hands together. He says, get away from here. You keep blessing them. You're not cursing them. And guess what? I'm not paying you. He says, but didn't I tell you? You give me a house of silver and gold. I'm not. I don't care. I can only speak the word of God. And then he has three more. So for seven, then we get curses over those who stand against Israel. Interesting, everything about Balaam is in a similar heptatic structure. And that brings us to the end of Numbers 24. But now in chapter 25, we discover what Jesus is talking about. And you can read it for yourselves when you go home. But um, basically, uh, Balaam says, hey, just invite the Moabite women in and they'll seduce the men. And they will start to worship their gods and will pollute the land that way. And oh my goodness, that's exactly what happened. So that is what Jesus does not like, right? So while they were staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. And the people ate the sacrificial meals and bowed down before these gods. Hey, way more than burning that little bit of incense that, that Antipas did. Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Do you see this, this marriage between Israel and uh, it's an adulterous affair with other gods, not with the God of Israel, right? And this is, lo and behold, the church history repeats itself. It has a marriage with the world, with society, with culture, with the, with the government. And don't forget, the governments of the world are in Satan's hands. It is absolutely true. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of must you must put to death. Those are your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. Nevertheless, here we go. I, 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 I have these things against you. Um, there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Baal who taught. So there... It, it's like us going to pornography to these days. It's us having sexual immorality, in the ways of the world. That is what it's all about. That's what Jesus does not like. If, if you are a Christian, you're set apart. You are unique. You are holy before him. And if you do fall, you instantly repent, turn from your ways. You go the other way. You leave the sexual immorality behind you and you choose Jesus. That is exactly it. And then we have the Nicolaitans, which is interesting. Two schools of thought about the Nicolaitans, um, and they are um, they are the ones either from Nicholas of Antioch who took them along this path and said, "Don't worry about it. You go ahead and be sexually promiscuous. It doesn't matter." Or 
Um, Nitko, which means rulers, laetans, where you get the word laity in Greek, that the church would have clergy that would rule over the laity. So those are the two concepts. I'm going to continue to research it and I'll continue to report. But we have an interesting thing because now we have the reward and the hidden manna. And I'm way out of time, but um, let's take a look at the manna real quick. The one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. Did you know that the manna is Jesus himself? Eat my body, drink my blood, eat the manna. Jesus, so this is the story where Jesus explains it. He feeds the 5,000, okay? Then he walks across the sea in the night, right? He walks across the Sea of Galilee, gets to the other side. He sent the others on ahead, right? And now they're on the other side. And the crowd hops into boats and they come across too. And they found him right after the feeding of 5,000. So this is tomorrow, the next day. Yesterday, he fed the 5,000. Now they're on the boats and they come over and there they are. And Jesus says, you came to find me, um, not because of the miracles that I performed, but because you ate and were filled. The following is the dialogue. So this is, brings us the context of what Jesus says. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? How did you get here? We didn't see you hop into the boat with the disciples. Hey, I walked across, no big deal. Um, Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God, the Father, has placed a seal of approval. And they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Oh, my goodness, that's the job, to believe in Jesus. That's our job. we got to believe in Jesus because all this other stuff goes with it. Don't get married to the world. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? <laughs> he fed 5,000. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's explaining to them that when Moses got the manna to come down from heaven, it was a foreshadowing of him. If you're ever in doubt about the word of God, put Jesus in the middle of it and you'll understand it. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Oh, Jesus, you are the manna. You are what God gives that provides life. Oh, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and yet you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he's given me, but raise them up at the last day. Wow. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him. Again, this allusion back to Moses with the bronze uh, serpent on the pole, right? As you look to him, right? And believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because they said, I am the bread of life come down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say I came down from heaven? Jesus knows that they're grumbling. Stop grumbling among yourself. Jesus answers, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone has heard the Father and learned from him who comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father, and he's speaking about himself. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread, my body, eat my body, right? will live forever. And of course, it's metaphorical. It's, 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 Jesus isn't saying here, start gnawing on me. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then the Jews argued sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you'll have no life in me. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise them up at the last day for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats, and don't forget, we're in a spiritual realm. We need to be born of spirit and truth. We need to understand this in the spiritual context. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. 
But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Capernaum is his hometown. The synagogue is the one that the Roman built where he went and, and, and helped his servant, right? On hearing it, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. These words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say this, why I told you, no one come to me unless the Father's enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you not want, do you want to leave? Do you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you're the Holy One of God. Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? And he met Judas, the son of Iscariot who through one of the 12 was later to betray him. Now, interestingly, um, we've run out of time, but the manna goes into the Ark of the Covenant. When that Ark Covenant is revealed in the millennial reign, it will still have the manna in it. Don't forget, if you picked up too much or you, or you went to pick some up on Saturday, it would spoil and rot because it was the day of rest. You picked up double on Friday. It lasted through the weekend. You could eat it on Saturday. Very interesting. It lasted in the golden jars through the eons of the ages. You can bet your bottom dollar there's no vermin or any spoiling going on inside the Ark of the Covenant, right? And it contained the golden jar of manna. We discover that in Hebrews 9. It also had Aaron's staff in it and the stone tablets of the covenant. Very interestingly. Um, it went down into Zedekiah's cave. We get that out of the Apocrypha. Uh, I hope to get a chance to tell you all about that. It's down there still. All right, that's it. Guys, you can see why I really only want to get through Pergamum because that's way too much stuff to try to do a tire on top of it. But we're we're open now for some discussion. So any thoughts or concepts? And by the way, I think there's a chat mode for those of you who are online. If you want to chat, you could you could send type message. something and send a message. Or put your hand up there. Or put your hand up. Okay. Anyway, um, anybody have any thoughts, anything that resonates with you, anything that's new to you out of Pergamum? All of these seven churches are not in existence today. They all all being from Asia Minor, which is Turkey. Yeah. There is an underground church in Izmir, which is Smyrna, and incredible stories coming out of there, but it's still the persecuted church of Smyrna. Um, the, a lot of the other cities have become archaeological ruins, so there's no real presence, but that's a really good question. I'm going to study that and find out. You can go on a tour through Turkey or maybe before things got volatile again, but there was a time when I've heard of people who've actually toured the seven churches. It's a, a Middle Eastern tour that you can go and see them, right? Just like Karen and I went to Patmos and Ephesus, you could go see the churches. At that time, we could have, honey, and we sure should have. You went there long enough. <laughs> That's right. That's, right. That's, right. That's not the name of it today. What's the name of the island today? Patmos today. It is still Patmos. Still Patmos. Very short boat run to Ephesus. So it belongs to Greece. It's part of Greece. Isn't it? Yeah, I believe so. It's right off Turkey. Yeah. You know, very much um, the history of the church. So we're seeing the unfolding of the church of Pergamum, which then would have been the time in the early Roman Empire where suddenly it becomes the law that you have to become Christian under theodosis well that really became bad because suddenly a reprobate people and you read about all the early popes a lot of them bought their position of pope oh my goodness very scary sorry if that offends anybody but there's a lot of history there that we can unpack just takes hours and hours can't do it all in, in an hour in the morning so so you see the church married right even pontius maximus is the title of the pope but it was the title first of the roman emperors it's on the coins. You can read it because, you know, the Latin is clear enough. Uh, as per the alphabet, you can actually make it out. Pontius Maximus, 
right? Oh man, oh man, oh man. The yearly Caesars made themselves the head of the church, which actually actually was the, the church world was at its pinnacle at where Zeus was born in Pergamus, where the Pergamum altar was. So they were really guarding that. And that's why Domitian asked Antipas to, to burn incense to him there, right? And why he makes a spectacle of them. Wow. Yes. <clears throat> That's in Berlin now. Do you have any sense of who's behind that? Like who's who's so motivated to want to do that? To keep keep, keep the history of, of the Nuremberg Ultra alive or the museum itself. The museum just goes through its regular cycle of aged buildings. I mean, this is a bit of an aged building. We're spending money on trying to keep it up. You know, we have to redo the roof. And so um Whenever they did it, so in the 19, 1909, they built a place, but it has structural issues, so they got to tear that down. But by 1930s, hurrah, we got a new building for the Pergamum altar. And when Karen and I went to see, it was already a little bit aged, a little bit dated. So then in 1995, they decide, uh, or 2000, sorry, 2015, they decided we got to rebuild this museum, 2015. So then they have Adder, but it's probably the Department of Antiquities of Germany that says it's, and, and so really I think Satan is behind it and is, is doing the timing of it and sends it to Moscow as, as a spoil of war, just in time for all the killing to happen under Stalin, only to get it back to Germany. That's why I'm really nervous right now. <laughs> Mind you, if I was in Berlin, I'd be sure to go see it. Wow. Maybe try to cast that out, eh? Pray hard. <laughs> Let there be no influence. And it's very subliminal, right? I'll bet most of Germany doesn't even see the Pergamum altar as the throne of Satan. It has registered on them, right? But Jesus says it so clearly. Wow. <laughs> and when you saw what rolled out of, uh, you know, the inspirational enlargement of it in the tribunal under Hitler, you realize, wow, how could anything be more satanic than that? In the meantime, um, Gehring, Gehring is it? Uh, that is Goebbels? Oh. Gehring, it was Gehring. Gehring oh, is, Gehring oh. is, Gehring is trying to build a new religion around the master race and uh, has this whole theory about, you know, sort of the super race, right? And then at the same time, they're taking Jews and they're killing them to analyze their skeletons so that they can prove that they're an inferior race. It's like, oh. That was Joseph Mandela, wasn't it? Yeah, the doctor. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, and then he... Right, it's right at the end of the war, so suddenly he mutilates those bodies, and then and then the allies come and find it there. Oh my goodness! And then of course he's put on trial. So it's, it's, it's a state you just get caught up in the culture. Yeah, yeah. The Aryan race, the master race, <laughs> and not the word of God. They're going to found a new religion that all of Germany would embrace. My father got told, yeah, now it's the Jews, but after the war, it's going to be the Christians who watch. Thank God things turned around. And we can see the World Economic Forum now, Germany, out of Schwab and that Noah Harari now, yeah. through this transhumanism. Mm -hmm. It talks about the clay feet and iron. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't mix with our mind. And this 5G, 6G, they'll be able to read through the vaccination because they've got metals in the vaccination and eventually it is, you tie that all together. I was just listening to a documentary on that. I just, I just shuddered. Yeah. Everybody thought it was over in the 30s and that Hitler was the Antichrist and Mussolini was one of the prophets and on and on it went. Um, and I don't know how long Christ will tarry, but I know we're a lot closer now than we were decades ago. And so we need to be aware and we need to read the words of Jesus to us very specifically so that we can be aware of what the end time looks like, right? Because the devil wants us not to know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
And it may not be in our lifetime. It may go another cycle, right? Because it's like the birth pangs, which to me is cyclical. Like when you have labor pains, it's like, oh, the baby's coming, the baby's coming. Oh, it subsides. And now it's not yet. And, and, and then you get another birth pang, right? But always be ready. Like if you're not ready to have that baby, you're not holding it back. When it comes, it comes. It's got no choice. It's You're going to be delivered of it, right? It's, uh, it's, it's when the push comes. And then it happens all quickly at the end. Suddenly, suddenly will unfold. Well, you, so. you hear some lady say, you know, babies are born in the elevator, just came so quick. They... Yeah. Taxi, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. There's no choice sometimes. Part of that sometimes, you know. Yeah. The birth of a child is so quick. And Such a good cool. analogy, isn't it? Yeah. That is the second coming. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about Christ being the manna, which is the reward, mm -hmm. right? The manna in heaven. To the one who is victorious, I'll give some of the hidden manna. I also give that person a white stone. Oh man, we could go another hour on the white stone. Yeah, with a name that's written known only to the person who receives it. <laughs> There's not enough time. It's 10 o'clock. So thank you guys. Let's close in a word of prayer, Heavenly mm -hmm. Father. We just thank you for your church and for Park Meadows and for the truth of it. And Lord, as your word gets spoken this morning, we pray that it would resonate in our hearts. Lord, we just pray that uh, as we've looked at the church or Pergamum, the throne of Satan, the, the, the city where Satan lives, and we saw that people were faithful even in that context. We want to be the faithful ones, Lord, that do not... Uh, prostitute ourselves with the world and do not defile ourselves with sexual immorality. We want to stay pure to you and we want to have our doctrine clean and pure before you. We want to stay focused on you. Help us, Lord, to be victorious so that we can enjoy you, the manna in heaven, the, the gift of life, life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen.